Let's imagine that you're back in school and midterm exams are about to start. How exactly are you going to study for them? Some common approaches might be to reread the study materials or lecture notes to highlight and try to memorize key terms and to go over your notes over and over again until the test comes. Now those all sound like they would be effective study techniques. However, cognitive research has shown that many of the traditional study patterns that students have followed for decades simply do not work. Now I didn't make up that list of study patterns. Those are exactly what I used to do whenever I was preparing for exams. However, I discovered that after failing a number of tests that these strategies failed miserably when it came to helping me truly learn the material. This type of approach to studying doesn't work because our minds don't function like computers. A computer takes in information and then it can spit it back out. However, our minds are more relational in nature. By relational in nature, I mean that our brain functions more like a graph-based network. If new information enters a brain without being connected to any of our previous knowledge, it's going to simply be rejected. For example, let's imagine that you are new to learning programming. If you simply run through a list of programming terms and syntax rules, you might memorize them in the short run. However, because your brain hasn't been properly introduced to the concepts, it's going to eventually eject the information. And it does this because it views it as being useless since it's not related to anything else and it's not connected to the rest of your view of the world. However, imagine that you took a different approach. In this new, more enlightened approach, you'd work with your brain and you would allow it to connect the new programming concepts that you're learning to knowledge and experiences that you already have. Let's take a case study. Whenever I'm teaching a new programming concept to students, I try to draw a fitting analogy to a real world concept. This process is called reification, and I view this as one of the most important tasks that I personally have as a teacher. Let's imagine that you're learning about the MVC, which stands for Model View Controller Design Pattern in the software development world. You could take the approach of trying to memorize each one of the roles of the model, the view, and the controller. However, that strategy wouldn't really help you answer questions related to how each of the components components work together. And even if you memorize things like the quiz questions and answers, you're probably going to have issues answering anything that you haven't memorized. But what if instead of trying to memorize key terms about the MVC pattern, you focused on drawing a real world analogy to the entire process? My favorite way to understand this type of architecture is comparing it to a restaurant. In this example, the model is a chef in the kitchen. In the same way that the chef prepares the meal for customers, the model works directly with the data for the application. And next we have the controller. The controller works like the restaurant waiter. And in an application, a controller's role is based on taking requests and then managing communication between the model and the view. This is much like a waiter who takes customer orders and then communicates those orders with the chef and eventually brings the food out to the table. And lastly is a view. A view is like the table that a customer sits at and it doesn't do much besides provide a platform for placing the food on. This is exactly how a view should work in an application. If built properly, a view should simply be a place where the data is shown to users. Now do you see what we just did? We learned about a pretty complex topic, the MVC design pattern, in a way that our minds can actually comprehend. I could fall out of bed and recite back the role of each component of the MVC architecture. Not because I spent countless hours in trying to memorize them, but because I connected the concepts to real world experiences. Now that I've talked about a practical way to study and to be able to memorize and think through concepts, I want to discuss the topic of if studying should be hard or if it should be easy. And through the years, I've come to the conclusion that if studying is easy, I'm doing it wrong. 
Part of the reason why I used to follow the study pattern of read, memorize, and repeat was because it was easy. It wasn't mentally taxing to sit down and read through a textbook or study my notes. However, research is proving that these type of study habits are not only ineffective, they're also damaging. Now, a good question is, how are they damaging? If you follow this type of study pattern, you know one thing, it takes time. And all this time spent reading and memorizing could have been used in countless other ways that could have proven much more effective in the long run. And when it comes to studying, time is one of the most valuable assets that you have. So when you waste it, it's akin to committing an educational felony. In addition to reification, research is showing a number of other study practices that are more effective than some of the traditional methods. In their book, Make It Stick, cognitive psychologists Brown, Rodiger, and McDaniel use the following recommendations for studying. When learning from a textbook, use the key terms from the back of each chapter to test yourself. Next, list out the key terms and use each one in a paragraph. This is going to test if you understand a concept outside of the realm of simply answering a definition question. After you've gone through a chapter of a textbook, go through all of the key terms and then go back and create questions, your own questions, associated with each one of those terms and then answer them just like you were the one that was creating the test. Next, rephrase the main ideas in your own words as you go through the material. You can also relate the main concepts to your own experiences, much like the reification process that we already discussed. And lastly, never rely on a single source whenever you're learning something new. Whenever I'm learning a new programming language, I'm not happy with just going through one book or one tutorial series. There's many times where I'll come across a concept that is a little bit fuzzy and it's not quite clicking for me and it's not the instructor's fault or the writer, but instead it, they're just not connecting it with the way that my brain thinks personally. So what I do is I'll go out and I'll find two or three other sources that explain the exact same process. I did this just recently when I was teaching myself how to work with the TypeScript programming language. I used about four or five different sources for that and whenever I came across a concept that didn't make sense from one of them, I would hit two or three or in some cases four or five other books or videos or blog posts that talked about that concept until it really made sense in my mind so that I could teach it to others. In summary, when it comes to effective study practices, ensure that you're making the most of your time. Remember that the most important goal with studying is being able to retain knowledge and that you can use it in real world scenarios. And the best way to accomplish this goal is by following strategies that work with your mind's own learning patterns.